So let's jump into a small review from the first half of the, of the presentation earlier in the week. We started by kind of generalizing and giving ourselves a common benchmark or a common touch point for what nesting is within the context of this presentation. And very simply put, the process of efficiently manufacturing parts from flat raw materials, in, in most of our cases, uh, engineered wood panels, in a panel that will minimize material waste and increase material yield. We went through the basic manufacturing strategy or machining strategy of linear flow production, right? Straight line manufacturing. And the five basic components that can be utilized to achieve linear flow manufacturing. A standard nested base CNC, an outfeed solution, an automatic infeeding solution, Audited, automated and integrated part identification, in most cases in the woodworking industry, uh, barcode labels. And finishing up with automated storage and retrieval systems. We kind of look to simplify and, and generalize the contents of the, of the presentations into five categories, as you see here basic machines, three handling concepts, storage integration, and then last but not least, we'll touch on, I wanna say sunrise technology, but that's not really what it is. Robotics have been around for, for many, many years in other industries, but we are now starting to see robotics and integrations become more popular within the woodworking segment. These two sections were handled on Wednesday. Bringing around the basic solution and putting a, a nice little bow on that, right? That's basically the machine you see on your screen here. Just a, a, a normal router, as you call it. Manually loaded, automatically processing your parts and manually unloaded. The concept one category, the basic CNC machine that we just reviewed with the addition of an outfeed conveyor belt. Some may call it a push off table, some call it a discharge table, as well as the automatic push off device mounted to the back of the gantry. Coming forward into what will be discussed new today, concept number two, concept number three, storage systems and robotics. And with that, let's jump into today's new content. So if we visualize moving from concept one, which is the machine and the push off system Concept two brings in an a automatic pre-positioning device on the front end of the machine, in many cases a scissor lift. And you'll see on the back of the gantry, now a set of uh, loading grippers, most often vacuum cups, suction pods to pull the raw sheet into the machine automatically instead of being manually loaded by the operator. And we see that nicely described for us in this graphic. Keeping in concert with our strengths and weaknesses focus from the initial half of the presentation, I had made the point that as manufacturers, we need to be, you know, obviously in tune to the strengths of the solutions that way we may be recommending for you. But we also have to be responsible enough to also discuss the weaknesses, of, the weaknesses of these solutions with you, right? We need to be able to bring that full understanding to you as we look to make recommendations for your current and or future investments. So let's start with the, the strengths of, an, of, a, of a through feed or an automatically loaded and unloaded router. We start to see 
uh, more consistency in terms of production velocity or throughput. And by that, I mean, we're removing more requirement of the operator each level of automation that we increase on the machine. So here, um, in terms of loading and unloading, the machine always takes roughly 40 seconds to load a new panel. And it always takes roughly 15 seconds to unload a finished panel. And we're leaving only the processing time as a variable component of your cycle time, right? So now the operator becomes more of a part catcher at the end of the outfeed belt. And he has, he or she has less input or effect on the throughput of the machine because it's loading and unloading itself. This is also the area of nesting automation where we start to see the operator be provided more time to do something else in the shop while the router is running, right? They're no longer required to load the next panel to the machine. They're no longer required to unload uh, the finished parts from the machine. And what you typically see is about four minutes or so within a six minute cycle time on the machine where your router operator is in an effect standing there with nothing to do, right? For an operator, that's great. Um, as a production manager or a business owner, what else can we do with that time, right? So when we see Concept2 solutions um, being utilized effectively in shops, oftentimes the operator of the machine will do something else. We've seen guys set up um, hinge insertion or hardware insertion stations where they're inserting cams or hinges or handles to doors. Other things that we'll see um, if you end up as a confirmat or a dowel constructor, or those, if those are your construction methods, an operator from a Concept2 router may also run an automatic bore and dowel machine or a dowel shooter um, set up within a couple steps of the outfeed table. And in other scenarios where we have uh, machines that are running, running long nests, so instead of a six minute cycle, maybe it's a 10 or a 12 minute cycle, um, we may even see CNC operators double up as an edge bander operator um, as long as it's paired in the general vicinity of the machine. Um, and of course, when you're not required to load 65 to 100 sheets of 4x8 material or 5x10s or 5x12s, depending on the size of your CNC, you do see less operator fatigue, right? They have the, a similar amount of energy on Monday uh, that they will on Friday because they're just not, we're just not wearing them out as much as we would with a, a semi manual or full manual machine. Uh, weaknesses, of course, this is important to understand also. Um, as we grow in automation and as we grow in our ability to introduce linear flow into the shop, we also become long, right? We become more linear. So in this case, um, you got roughly a 12 foot router, you're gonna have a 12 foot scissor lift and you're gonna have a 12 foot outfeed table. So the length of that solution um, becomes long. And if we're working with limited floor space and, and smaller shops and or expensive real estate, um, it is important to understand the footprint that the machines will require within the shop. I think there is an, a weakness within the next couple levels of automation that we'll, we'll, we will discuss, and it's an emotional weakness in terms of as manufacturers and companies looking to make investments, we are emotionally led to believe, or we, you know, we believe it ourselves, that the more automation we invest in, the faster the machine is going to produce. Right? And there is some truth to that, but it's largely application-based, meaning if we revert back to the concept one scenario where we're automatically unloading a finished nest, but we're manually loading it, if we take the emotion out of it and you have an operator that can consistently load a raw board to the router in 45 seconds or less, that operator with the push-off machine 
is going to achieve the same levels of throughput as the concept two solution that will automatically load itself in about 45 seconds of cycle time. So I always throw caution and make some recommendations to get beyond the emotion of what you believe is best and really work with your chosen sales partner to get down into the details and the data and understand how each of those may look within your particular application, right? And then lastly, a weakness of a machine loaded from a scissor lift, for example, is it, it's a little bit less flexible than manually loading the machine, meaning, you know, typically you're going to bring me a bunk of 35 sheets of four by eight white melamine and the concept two solution is going to click through those pretty quickly. Now, if you say, instead of running 35 sheets of white, the first half of the day, I want to run five whites, five reds, five blues, five greens, and five, five foot by five foot Baltic birch plywood pieces. Now we're looking at having to change that material over on the scissor lift three or four or five times. And in most cases, it takes about 10 minutes to change over the scissor lift. So that could be anywhere from 30 minutes to 50 minutes where the machine is not running um, because you have a lot of variation on the front end. The other solution to that is build what we call a rainbow stack, right? You pre-build the bunk of materials before you put it on the scissor lift, and then the machine runs what it needs in that order. Uh, but you also got to consider that you're investing labor and time into pre-building a stack of material for the scissor lift. And last but not least, in terms of less flexible on the front end, um, we all know in the woodworking industry, not every panel that we bring to a router or a saw or any machine in our shop for that matter is perfectly flat, right? Some edges are warped up a little bit, some are warped more. And when you're dealing with a concept two solution, the position of the raw board on the scissor lift is the orientation of that board when the machine grabs it and it brings it in. So if we run 10 sheets from the scissor lift and the 11th sheet is warped up like a, like a U, the machine's gonna load it in and, and likely not be able to fixture all those parts because of the warp of the machine. So it's a little bit less flexible in that if that warped board was loaded to say a concept one solution, the operator would know to flip it over so that it's bowed like an M and the machine's vacuum system has a greater opportunity to pull that warp out of it. A little bit of a cycle time analysis, um, new for, for those joining today and a little bit of review from, from Wednesday. I made the statement that it's important to understand cycle time and not only processing time, right? So this graphic on the bottom is a cycle time of the standard solution, the basic router. Processing time was six minutes and 30 seconds. The full cycle time 12 minutes and 30 seconds in that usually about an hour or an hour, one minute to load a raw panel, about four minutes to unload and sort the parts from the machine after it's been processed and about one minute to clean up. As you move into your concept ones and twos and higher, we start to eliminate this time down here right, the red area for which the machine is not operating, but not broken. It's simply waiting for the operator to handle the manual portion of the cycle time. On your concept twos, as we just showed, we start to really, really start to hit some high production numbers in that about 45 seconds to load a raw part, the machine automatically unloads the nest that was processed onto the outfeed table and loads the next sheet so that five minutes of you know wasted time potentially down here becomes 15 seconds and your waiting time is is only one minute 12 minutes and 30 second cycle time actually becomes six minutes and 30 seconds or seven minutes and 30 seconds up here and you'll see your processing throughputs jump to about 65 sheets per per day 
Uh, some tips and tricks here. Um, we touched on this a little bit. Understand the number of non-flat materials that you run each day, right? If you're running cabinet grade plywood that's largely flat, perfect. If you're a, a plywood guy where maybe you're taking truckloads in from overseas and the top few sheets of each bundle are largely unusable, um, that would impact how effective a concept two solution would be for you. And then lastly, material mix. Understand that there is downtime of the machine related to changing over materials on the scissor lift. And or also understand if you're willing to uh, invest time in creating rainbow stacks of materials to help minimize the number of changeovers of your scissor lift you would utilize within a given day. Here we're going to throw this over to uh, the style showroom in our East Building campus here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and we're going to run you through a Concept 2 cycle time demonstration. So it looks like we're picking this demonstration up about mid-cycle. The vertical drilling of the program has been completed by the machine. And we are now into the part formatting or part sizing portion of the routine. So if you recall back to Wednesday, we ran the really ugly yellow board. Uh, we ran fast, about 50 meters per minute, and we ran a nesting strategy from the software side for stay down nesting, meaning the router entered the cut one time, cut all the parts, and then came out. In this particular nest, we're not running an ugly yellow board, obviously. Um, we're not running stay down nesting, where if you watch the router here, each time it processes one of the parts, it exits the part and moves to the next. And we're also running what I would say more of a, of a traditional processing speed, uh, a nice three flute tool running at, I believe, 30 to 32 meters per minute um, in contrast to the 50 that we ran on the smaller machines in Wednesday's demonstration. So the concept two solution finished the first nest and now it's going to operate in what we call a simultaneous onload and offload. Some guys call it push pull, other manufacturers have their names for it. But in these situations, this is where you start to see unloading and loading at the same time. And that helps also increase some of the throughputs. The machine will pause at the start of the finished product. It drops its push off device. And now we're unloading, cleaning, as well as loading the next raw board within a single movement of the machine's gantry. And what you're watching here, this is how this particular machine zeroes the board in X and Y on the machine table. We pull it to a reference fence in the front and there's a laser light in the front that gives us an accurate loading position of that, of that raw board. In this case, the outfeed belt is being unloaded while the router enters the drilling and machining cycle of the next board. Moving up to the third level of automation from concept two to concept three. What we see here now is the standard machine, the outfeed system, the infeed system, and concept three introduces automatic part identification or barcode labeling prior to the raw board being machined. Three-dimensional view of, of that overhead, standard machine, outfeed, infeed, and here we see the automatic label printing device.
there are strengths and weaknesses of this solution as well. Um, by introducing automatic barcode labeling, we, we eliminate that requirement of the operator, whether it's on the machine table or at the end of the outfeed table, which is common of the concept two solutions. The system is able to orient the label to a specific edge of the part. So why is that a strength? Why do we care about that? When you start to look at investing in automation at the concept three level, we're really looking to take responsibility for as much of the process as we can. So if we are saying we want to automate, automatically label a part for which there are multiple downline processings for, meaning it could be horizontal drilling and or edge banding, let's use those for example. You can create labels that will specifically guide the operator, whether at the router or somewhere else downline, to say this part gets red edge banding on this edge, white on the left edge, blue on the right edge, and nothing on the fourth edge, right? And if the machine or the system isn't able to correctly orient the label to the edge of the part prior to machining, you're not able to do that, right? Um, in most cases, when parts are label edge orientation specific, it's an operator that's doing that, right? But in terms of, of that operator, he, typically he or she is a little bit more experienced and you're always kind of wondering what happens if he or she chooses not to work for me any longer, right? This type of concept three solution can help simplify what the operator is required to do while not minimizing the ability of the machine to direct future processes. Uh, there are some weaknesses. Uh, the same thing with that emotional appeal. It's, it's the same as the concept two. Just because we automate in-feed label printing doesn't guarantee that it's faster than a concept two machine with an operator labeling at the outfeed. What it does guarantee is that there's less thinking required of the operator related to labeling than utilizing a manual or semi-manual approach. Uh, I always say labeling is an art um, and it's true, right? Are we using paper, paper labels? Are we using mylar labels? What size labels do you want to use? Are you including graphics uh, within the barcode? How much information do you want to, to provide to your shop within the barcode? It's not as easy as just sticking the sticker on the part, right? We're taking that decision that's often made from the shop floor and with an automatic labeling system, we're now making that choice in the, in, the, in the programming office, right? We're doing all of this with the software program and sending the information to the machine. So it's important to remember um, that as you kind of step into this level of automation. And lastly, this is often overlooked, uh, textured melamines really gaining popularity here um, in North America. And if you look at a, a deeply textured melamine panel and you stick a sticker on it, there's just not much surface area for that label to adhere to. So as you pre-label a textured melamine board and you run it through a nesting process, your dust brushes are dragging over that label. Some machines have protective flap scenarios that are also dragging over that label. And there's almost a guarantee that not all of your labels on a textured melamine nest will stick all the way through <laughs> to the outfeed table, right? So just kind of think about that. If that's a, a, a portion of your business, uh, make sure we understand how we're gonna handle the textured melamines as it relates to label application. Uh, some tips, um, we kind of touched on this a little bit. Uh, consider a relabeling strategy textured melamines being a big one, um, but also four standard labels as well, right? You may lose one throughout the nest and it's common for concept three solutions to also be integrated with a, with a solution for uh, manually applying labels at the outfeed, uh, either for 
textured melamines that we may choose not to pre-label or regular product that may lose the label through the machining process and the operator can quickly re-identify that part after processing. We're gonna move into a couple short clips. We're gonna throw this one out to a customer location in Rocky Ridge, Utah and watch two clips of Concept3 machines. So this first short clip is more of a close-up of the Concept3 CNC itself. It's basically a two-axis cantilever machine configured to <laughs> stick stickers on raw boards. Once it's finished, it parks, it signals the, the router, hey, I'm free and clear and out of the way, come get the raw board and process it. And then the second video, same machine, similar process, a little bit more of a wide view. Here you'll get to see the, the printer and the router operating simultaneously. watching here is envision where your operator is within this process, right? He or she is at the end of the outfeed table, removing finished parts that are already pre-labeled, carting them up, getting them down to the next process, and possibly having the time to run a secondary uh, process as well. Moving from concept three now into CNC nesting strategies integrated into storage and retrieval systems. You'll start to notice familiar components from both portions of the demonstration or the presentation this week. Standard machine, outfeed, infeed roller section now instead of a scissor lift. And this last section of automation brings in what we call a storage and retrieval system. Strengths and weaknesses here, highly, highly flexible front end right? It's almost limitless in terms of the amounts of materials and SKUs that you can enter into a storage and retrieval system. And the machine will be configured to bring the right board of the right color, the right size, at the right time, to the right machine without damage, right? So that's the value of these storage and retrieval systems. They're highly configured to be efficient with batch size one manufacturing. So 15 years ago, I would say I saw lots of batch quantity 50, right? 50 of the same cabinet or 60 or 100. Um, today, we're seeing far less of those large batch quantities that customers are looking to run through nesting machine and a lot more of batch size 10, batch size five, or batch size one, and wanting to know how do I do, right, 100 batch ones in a day with a, with a router. And the storage and retrieval system is that type of solution. We're focused today on CNC, but within a storage and retrieval systems, multiple machines can be integrated, as well as multiple platforms, meaning it could be a nested machine and a panel saw or two saws and one nested machine or four nested machines, or you'll start to see some systems as we get into some of our higher volume shops, integrating you know, four or five nesting machines and two saws. It's all specific to the floor space that you have available to the automation in your shop, as well as the application and outcome you're looking to achieve by investing in the automation. And the other thing you see, let's use uh, an integrated CNC as well as an integrated panel saw within a storage system. These systems have the ability to direct the nest or the optimized raw panel to the machine that's best suited to process it. 
right? So for example, if we have a cabinet nest, um, 10 parts, nine of them have five millimeter vertical drilling for system holes and eight millimeter construction holes, the system is gonna to decide to send that panel to the router, right? Because it has the ability to size the parts as well as vertically drill them. It may be followed by a nest of shelves and stretchers, which have very little or no vertical machining. And the system will decide to send that panel to the saw, right? And why? Because nothing cuts square parts with no machining faster than a panel saw. So you're starting to now be able to really squeeze every last bit of efficiency out of the machines in the system by giving them what they're best suited to produce. Uh, weaknesses of integration with storage systems, right? Data analysis is required. And I, I kind of say this tongue in cheek, but you have to have some data and understand your shop or your business to truly get the right solutions for yourself as it relates to this level of automation. Each system is entirely custom, right? The mechanics of each system, maybe not, but the amount of board we put in the storage system, the size of the stacks within the store, that's all configured to what you are, right? We don't sell you what we sold the guy 10 miles over because although you build cabinets, each, each is different, each process is different. Um, because data is required and each system is custom, the sales process feels slow to you, the customer, right? It's a little bit monotonous. We're super careful to make sure that we understand your data. We double check and we triple check to ensure that what we're doing will be as productive as after it's installed as it is on paper prior to sale. And lastly, the weakness is it, it, we feel a little bit intrusive to you. We're asking lots of questions, right? How many SKUs of material do you run? What types of board? What are your four or five highest runners of materials? And we ask why within these scenarios all the time because we wanna ensure that we're getting it right. And so a little bit of caution there is, if you've asked for a quote on a storage system that's best fit to your shop, and two hours later you have a full-blown proposal, uh, I would be raising my hand and asking some questions, right? So just understand that we're not trying to get information from you that we're not privy to have. We're just trying to get as much information from you as you will allow us so that we can provide the proper solution for your shop and your application. Okay, we're gonna go back down to Greg Hodges in our High Point North Car Carolina showroom, back to that ugly yellow board. And we're gonna run through uh, a CNC machine, concept two with the roller table integrated into the storage system. So what we're watching here, first board reloaded to the roller section by the Vortex system. Automatic loop outside of the storage unit so the router loading device has access. Router takes advantage of that panel, automatically loads and locates. Once it's loaded, the router will signal back to StoreTech that, hey, I'm out of your way. Safe to drop that next board on the roller conveyor. And then we'll access the next one. So when we say always have right material at the weight at the right time without delay and without damage, that process that we just saw there, all that mechanically happened. Uh, if you look at what's happening here, we saw the loading device of the storage system kind of hanging over the machine waiting 
after it uh, dropped the second panel on the machine. That cycle time is available to the to the store tech to do things that we explained in the slide before. Load a saw, load another router, um, but also bring new raw material into the storage system, as well as potentially build rainbow stacks of material to an outfeed station that you may utilize for a CNC or a saw that are non-integrated into the store tech, right? So the point I wanna make there is you may have a, a saw that's in good operating condition or a CNC that's in good operating condition. It doesn't matter the brand. Um, you can utilize some of the benefits of the storage solution, pre-build bunks of, of material for those uh, outside or non-integrated machines and still increase the performance of those machines with, with store tech solutions. Moving from that, we'll touch a little bit on robotics and where they are finding homes within the CNC woodworking and plastics industries. A couple images of some recent installations and integrations. And before discussing them, we're gonna start with the video. Um, we're gonna throw this one over to Hanover, Hanover, Germany and run a video of a robot unloading an outfeed table of a nested base CNC. So we're about three quarters of the way through unloading that nest. What you're watching here is the robot knows the general area of where the part is on the outfeed belt, but not the exact orientation because that stuff kind of moves and shifts a little bit. So if we kind of watch here, to access a part, it's going to take it over top of that. It looks like a T-stand. It's actually a camera system. When the light goes red, we're, we're visually understanding from the corner of that board which orientation the robot has it so it can accurately detect over to the pallet on the floor. So, I don't know about you guys, but I could watch this all day, and I have. scrap off into the bin. And the next part will be on its way out. So robotics, what are we looking to achieve here uh, by integrating these with nesting machines, right? We're moving towards, um, I say, nearly autonomous CNC production. Um, in my opinion, there is no operatorless lights out type stuff that we're doing here yet. Um, the system still needs an operator, right? In and around it, he may be responsible for the CNC machine, the store tech, the robot, and an, an edge bander cell. But we do need somebody in and around the area that has the ability to, you know, to work with the machines within the cell if, if, it, if an error or something technical needs to happen. The focus with robotics and nesting at the moment is, the OEMs in the market or the manufacturers of, of the equipment are largely focusing on unloading the machines or de-stacking, right? In my personal opinion, in terms of, let's go back to, to Wednesday, return on investment is important, right? It should be one of the most important criteria that you use to make a determination of if and when you invest in these types of technologies. For me, buying a robot to simply take parts off a nesting machine, an outfeed table or whatnot, and put them on a pallet on the floor for which a forklift or an operator with a hand truck 
has to come over, open a safety door, pull the parts out and drag them over to the edge bander to be edge banded. I don't know if we're displacing enough labor to really justify the investment in the technology. Um, maybe if you tell me we're gonna unload two robots with one router and stack parts on the floor, well, maybe we're getting somewhere then in my, my personal opinion, where I believe automatic de-stacking of the CNC's has an ROI that is acceptable in many North American businesses is when we're using them to automatically transport individual parts to the next process in the shop or small packages of parts to the next process in the shop. Um, I'm not trying to get way, way up in the clouds here. Automated, automated guided vehicle technology, AD, AGVs, which you see here. These are cool little guys that can take, you know, packages of parts to edge banders or the next process in the shop. Um, largely those are controlled by MES systems, manufacturing execution systems. We're really up there in the software world. Highly effective, but also there's a limited amount of, of customers that have the resources to, to really get up there. They're starting to become a little bit more simple in that you can set pathways for AGVs with a simple tablet, right? Here's where you are, here's where I want you to go, go, right? So now we're starting to take that technology into let's say the middle of the market. But I say, don't sleep on simple conveyance, right? Pick the part up, drop it on a conveyor belt, move it to the next process. It's easy to put inline barcode scanning in there. It's easy to transfer data. And now we truly, in my opinion, displace the operator from unloading the router because there isn't a requirement even to come in with a hand truck or a forklift. So if we are somewhat skeptical of the data required of our businesses to integrate a store tech or consider an investment of a store tech, it's similar here in terms of data. Right? We really want to make sure we're able to provide you an ROI that's acceptable within the solution. And we really try to work you past the cool factor of a robot, potentially an AGV, and really get down into the data and the facts you know, before potentially we waste your time and or maybe uh, you know, we spend our resources that, that may or may not generate a sale also. And lastly, we put this ponder question up there, right? Am I really ready for this, right? It's cool. The technology is becoming more um, general. Uh, the user interface between the operator, the machine, and the programmer is becoming simpler and costs are coming down. But ask yourself, are you really ready before we, before we go down that particular road as it relates to robotics? Uh, wrapping up both sections, right? Section number one and section number two, the five sections of general material handling automation as it relates to CNCs. Concept one, router manually loaded and manually unloaded. Concept one, router manually loaded, automatically unloaded. In this scenario, we'll see often see a vacuum loading device or some sort of assistance. So the operator can get a raw board on the, the machine a little bit quicker and also do it 50 to 65 plus times in an eight hour day, right? Without totally wearing themselves out. Concept two, router, outfeed, automated infeed. Concept three, router, outfeed, automated pre-labeling system, automated infeed, and then finishing up with the, the highest levels of automation, router, outfeed, infeed with the storage and retrieval system, and concluding with the robotics, the small time that we spent on robotics a couple minutes ago. I wanna end with the same statement that we made to open on Wednesday. Right? Nesting automation is entirely possible. It's available and it's proven. Um, we wanted to dispel the myth 
right? That nesting is an ancillary technology, right? It can be slow and dirty, but as you look at some simple levels of automation, uh, it can become clean and it can become highly productive. Uh, 65 to 75 sheets is a general expectation of a concept two. And depending on your application, we have customers out there up over 100 to 125 sheets per day off that level of technology. And kind of putting a bow on that, nesting can and does drive production within our shops here in North America. Four final takeaways before we jump into some Q&A, right? Nesting is a proven yet growing manufacturing strategy. As you move through and up the levels of automation, they bring you the ability to improve efficiency, improve cleanliness, and re reduce the dependence of the operator to achieve the desired throughput. As you look at these systems and try to figure out what is best for you, right? Please form a relationship with a vendor, somebody that you trust, that you'll open up a little bit. Tell them your strengths and weaknesses. Tell them your dreams. What am I now? What do you want to be in five years or 10 years? And trust them that that information is held confidential so that we can become consultative, right? A consultative partner rather than a sales partner and ultimately help you let your application guide the decision on which level of automation and or if nesting is even right for you. Um, know that spoil board management is absolutely necessary. We spent a little bit of time on that on Wednesday. Um, and here, this last little graphic is more of a tip and a trick than anything whether it's a new nesting machine or one that you've had for five years or 15 years, these six components all have to have or receive attention from you in the future to gain the most throughput from that machine, right? Nesting is a balance of vacuum, dust collection, programming, tooling, spoil board condition and maintenance, and the operator. If all three of those are receiving attention and operating in sort of a concert, then your nesting machine is operating as it should. And with that, Taylor is going to take back the audio of the presentation. So thank you again for joining us today. To access previously recorded sessions like part one of material handling automation for nested based CNCs or to enroll in upcoming webinars, please visit styles.live.